from Microbe TV. This is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode 15, recorded on January 12th, 2017. This episode of Tuivo is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's new on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash T-W-I-E. Hey, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today for the first Tuivo of 2017 from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Greetings, Vincent. Great to be here with you on the first episode of 2017 from LD Lab Studios. Happy New Year, Nels. Thanks. Happy New Year to you. And uh, it was my birthday 10 years ago. Yeah. And I am at that age where I have a Beatles song written about me. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. I don't know if you remember Um, Beatles. You may be too young, Nels. No, no, of course. (laughs) This sounds like a a milestone just happened. Uh, It's a nice number. 64... You know, is a great number. It's eight squared. Yeah. It's two to the something too, right? Two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, six. No, it's it's sixty-four. I guess it's not two to the something, but in in um, binary, it's one followed by six zeros. Wow. I'm a, I'm yeah. The, how do how do the lyrics go? Will you still need me? Will you still feed me? When is I'm that? sixty-four, that's part of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I was very excited to reach that age. There's nothing else good about it except <laughs> the Beatles song. Well, congrats on that on reaching that milestone. <laughs> You'll get there. <laughs> yeah, sooner than I'd like. I would get say. there too. <laughs> well, we have a, a very special guest. We've been uh, meaning to get on for some time. It's someone both of us uh, know and have met. I met not too long last year, I, I believe, at a meeting here in New York. She is a professor of organismic and evolutionary biology in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Harvard University. Hopi. Hookstra, welcome to Twivo. Oh, thanks so much, both of you, for having me. Our pleasure. And, Thank uh, you, Hopi. Yeah, it's, uh, we're excited to talk about what you're doing and so forth, and we're glad you could find the time. You know, everybody's busy. Sure. And maybe no a, problem. Po- a podcast is low on, but you're going to, you know, you're already famous, but this will <laughs> cement your fame even more. Oh, yep. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, I know you from Twivo. <laughs> you see, see, Nels's star has accelerated into the far reaches of the universe <laughs> as a consequence. Right. All my um, relatives got Twivo mugs for the holidays this year. So great. Um, at, least, at least in that circle, the um, uh, Twivo influence is extending. <laughs> I will. I will send one to Hopi. We will have. Oh, great! Because all our guests, yeah. we, we have send them a mug, and it sits on their desk, and it's a little bit of advertising. You know, people look at it and go, "What is that?" Well, let me tell you, and it has the link on it, so people can go right there. So Fantastic. we were we were talking about your name before in the pre-show. <laughs> Hookstra. Did I say it pretty well? Hookstra. Yeah. Pretty well, probably better than I can. So there was a uh, a fellow who invented the. Uh, microscope back in the 1600s who was from uh, uh, Belgium no uh, no ne- Holland. Holland Holland the Netherlands uh, Netherlands you're correct yep um, and hook is the same root and you said it means corner right yep that's and, right and stra means from from wow. right you, you know it's interesting nobody usually people ask me about my first name and much less <laughs> frequently my last name so this is a new a new topic for me so what about your first name <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I opened that door tonight. Um, <laughs> so um, the way I guess I would describe it is that it's a not super common, but not uncommon sort of term of endearment for a little baby in, in mm-hmm. Dutch. And so I was the first grandchild of my grandparents who lived in Holland and they came over to the States. So I was born in California. And apparently my parents hadn't settled on a name for me when I was born. So my parents have told me that my dad was rooting for Danielle and my mom was arguing for um, Sasha. Mm-hmm. And so my my Oma, my grandmother, didn't want to you know take sides, and so she had to refer to me as something. So she referred to me as the the little Hopi, um, the little Hopia, mm-hmm. and uh, that just stuck. And so it turns out my dad 
won in this battle. My actual name is Danielle, so my passport and driver's license all say Danielle. But um, since the you know age of one day, I have never been called Danielle. Mm, I think it's a lovely name. Oh, yeah, per- <laughs> perfect for the new year episode. Oh, Niles has a title, man. T- tell Hopi what's your title. <laughs> Uh-oh. We, well, so that's always becomes a, a big issue is what are we going to call each episode? And so oftentimes we have five or six different competing uh, titles for the show. This one was a slam dunk. Hopi New Year. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, my nickname when I was in grade school was Happy. Happy Hopi. There we mm-hmm. go. Even more appropriate. Is that because you you are happy? Um, I, that's what I like to tell people. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> funny when. Uh, so you and I met on the um, the board of Quanta, which is a magazine a magazine published by the Simons Foundation. And uh, the previous year, you couldn't make the meeting. That's right. So you phoned in, I think. That's and, right. Uh, yep. We were talking about you beforehand. And oh. <laughs> people were saying, wow, we have this powerhouse evolutionary biologist here, Hopi. And I said, wow, with a name like that, I mean, <laughs> sounds like a nice person. And you're very nice, too. So it's great to have both. You know, it's there are lots of powerhouses in science. We're not so nice. Oh. <laughs> but you have that, and you're nice, and you have a nice name, which kind of precedes you. So that's a great combination. <laughs> yeah, well, it's definitely a memorable name, right? So if somebody needs to Google me, I'm basically the only one that's going to show up. That's great. That's great. What's the middle? You have an initial E, right? What is that? Uh, that's just uh, just Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yep. Mm. And now you said you were born in California. What part? Yep. Um, so I was born at Stanford University Hospital. Wow. Uh, so I grew up in the Bay Area. Nice. So what were your parents? What kind of professions? Yeah. So my dad is an engineer mm-hmm. um, and uh, actually a, trained as a physicist. He likes to make that distinction. Um, and my mom originally came to the U.S. to be an au pair for a Stanford professor who's a, now a, a real big name in the stem cell biology world, Irv Weissman. No. <laughs> yep. So lots of people know Irv Weissman. Yeah. And so she you know, lived and raised his kids for a number of years and met my dad in California who had come over to um, work at HP. And they were set up on a blind date because they were both Dutch. So folks assume that naturally they would be a good pair. But in, in fact, it, it worked and they decided to stay in California. Wow. That's a great... Yep. I... Um... I, I met Irv at uh, in Montana a couple of years mm-hmm. ago. Yep. He has a home there. Yep, my so, mom knows that home. <laughs> so he's a good friend of David Baltimore, who was my postdoc advisor. Ah, so okay. David also has a home out there, and uh, I went to visit David. And Irv came to my seminar, and he gave me some great ideas for experiments. But yep. they said they used to share a home, but then Irv had too many kids, and they decided they needed to <laughs> <laughs> their own home. <laughs> Small world in science, not too many degrees of separation between contacts. Oh, it's amazing when you start talking to people. And that's why I love hearing people's stories because there's always a connection of some sort. The other one is that when I was looking for a job, I came to Columbia in 1982. My other offer, serious offer, was Stanford, so I could have been out there. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But uh, it was too far away from my roots. So did you go to high school in in, uh, Palo Alto? I went to Los Altos High School, which mm-hmm. the, was the big rival to Palo Alto. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was it was great. Okay. I really a great place to grow up. So your father, being a, uh, a, a physicist engineer, you did you have that science influence early on? Is that why you decided to do science? No, you know, um, I think I'm a good hybrid between my parents. So my mom, in addition to her um, career as an au pair, later on went on and became a teacher, um, primarily sort of nursery school teaching, um, and then later worked at an elementary school. So she's she's a real teacher and really creative. Um, and I think if I was going to attribute any sort of science leanings um, when I was younger, it would be to my mom. So I remember when my, my dad was often starting new companies and then they would sell the company and start a new company. So, you know, my mom would, um, there were certainly times where we didn't have a lot of money for fancy vacations or hobbies and so forth. So um, one of the things we used to do 
this is always the story I tell when my mom says, how, how did you grow up to be a biologist? But she used to take us out into the local sort of regional park and um, she had figured out where there was an owl sort of roost and we would go collect owl pellets and bring them home, soak them in water and bleach and rearticulate the mouse skeletons. And to me, uh, that's, you know, such a clear link to the types of things that I do now. <laughs> that's um, great. Yeah, so we, and you know, I just, I think a lot of it came from just a love of outdoors and living in California and going to Yosemite and all sorts of things like that it got mm -hmm. me, I think is what got me interested in biology. But I really didn't know I wanted to be a biologist um, until college. Where'd so you go to college? I was, uh, UC Berkeley. So our, mm. you know, my family having grown up in Palo Alto and gone to Stanford games, both my brother and I went to Berkeley. So we switched all our, <laughs> you know, red. Red clothing for blue and gold. <laughs> wow. Uh, not, far from transition. Home. not far from home, though, right? No, nope, no, nope, that's right. What did you major in? I majored in uh, integrative biology. Uh, so it was the old, uh, an old zoology program that uh, morphed into, I think I was the first, the first cohort to graduate as an integrative biologist. Hmm. No, I, I remember from my visit to Berkeley, the, that museum with the dinosaur skeleton, right? Yeah, right in the middle. So that was being renovated in my last year of um, my undergraduate, that um, building opened and mm -hmm. having a museum in there and so forth. So the museum uh, there really was instrumental in getting me excited about the types of things we do now and, and certainly is the link to my position now as a curator in the sort of comparable museum here at Harvard. Oh, that's so cool. So, so I hope you, when you, were, when you were at Berkeley, did you overlap at all with Mike Shapiro? Yes. <laughs> so, in in a very interesting way, because I never thought of Mike as a biologist until much later. So, um, one of the things I did when I, so one of the reasons I went to Berkeley um, was because uh, I had the opportunity to play Pac-10 volleyball. And mm. um, both of you have have met me. I'm not the tallest person. And so, you know, everybody is a little skeptical when I tell this story. So, I played for two years at Berkeley um, and, uh, you know, played against Stanford and all these all these fun fun things. Um, and Mike, actually, um, there's two connections. One, he played on the men's volleyball team, which was a club mm -hmm. team. But he was also the announcer for the women's team. So, you know, number 12, Lynn, blah, 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 goes up for a spike. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's I funny. Knew, I knew Mike as a volleyball player, and um, he, I believe, was a year ahead of me. And so we uh -huh. didn't take a lot of classes together. And it wasn't until I, as a postdoc, um, was on a sort of sabbatical. I worked in a lab at Stanford for um, six months or so, gaining some new skills. And David Kingsley's lab was down the hall. And I remember looking at their website, and there was a guy in the middle of the picture of the Kingsley Lab website at Stanford wearing a cow sweatshirt. And I was like, that is Mike Shapiro. And he's... <laughs> Anyway, so we sort of converged yeah. and we think about um, huh. lots of similar problems and so forth. But I will always, first and foremost, think of Mike mm -hmm. as our volleyball announcer. That's, that's really cool. We had him on the yeah. um, show a while back. I'm trying to remember which episode. But Mike was talking about, so he's a colleague of mine here at Utah. Who's, and he's transitioned from the Kingsley days and sticklebacks yep. to go all in on pigeon morphology and evolution. Yes, I've seen the pigeon palace, I think is what he refers to it as. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Episode 7, back in April, Nels. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Then I yeah. think also we had a Berkeley person uh, recently, Nicole King, right, Nels? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. N Nicole's a great friend. We The two of us um, edit for PLOS Genetics, so I talk to her every week on the phone, cool. um, which has just um, been just a real pleasure. She's wonderful. When you were at Berkeley, I, did, I you, did you work in... Uh, Anyone's lab as an undergraduate? Yes. Um, I When I decided, so I, I started there as a political science major, and it, I didn't realize I wanted to do biology until my second year. And so I was behind, you know, I hadn't taken all the basic physics and chemistry and so forth. But I was unsure if I wanted to do biology because, you know, the, the really interesting stuff at some level um, happens in those upper division classes. So I talked my way into a biomechanics class by a faculty named um, Bob Full. And he said, well, you can be in my class, but you have to work really hard. <laughs> and I took that to heart. And, you know, I was scared every, you know, every exam, every lecture. 
worked really hard. And at the end of the term, he invited me to um, do research in his lab. So um, I started my career running cockroaches on little mini treadmills, um, <laughs> measuring their oxygen consumption and looking at all sorts of bio, sort of biomechanical parameters. And while I didn't fall in love with uh, cockroaches or biomechanics per se, it definitely was the thing that um, sort of sparked my interest in research. Hmm. At what point did you decide to go on and get a PhD? So that was also, I was a little bit late in this um, sense too. So I took the MCAT and studied and I just assumed if you majored in biology, you would go on to medical school. Mm -hmm. And it was really towards the end of my um, time as an undergraduate. And I remember Bob, he would take the BART home to Walnut Creek, but you knew that if you caught him sort of a few minutes before he would leave for his scheduled train and you got him talking, um, he would stay and go on the next train. And so Friday afternoons, I used to em employ this strategy. <laughs> and what was great is he really, he would push me and say, you know, well, why do you want to go to med school? And, you know, really made me think about about things. And those Friday afternoon conversations were just um, wonderful. And the more, you know, I sort of thought about it, the more I realized the um, what I loved was the, this idea of discovery. Like it was my job to discover things nobody else knew. And what could be more fun than that? And uh, so he, Bob was really a big influence um, on me. So even though I took the MCAT, uh, I, I ended up not applying to med school and I took a year off and then uh, ended up at grad school. Did you work in a lab that year? No. Um, <laughs> so, so I had mentioned that, you know, cockroaches didn't really float my boat. So I, of course, did something um, extreme on the other end of the spectrum. I took the year off and went and worked in Yellowstone National Park on grizzly bears. <laughs> um, and that was, it was just a fun place to live and lots of uh, young people doing research and um, volunteering. And so I ended up working on grizzly bears. I've learned how to jump out of a helicopter. I've taken the rectal temperature of a um, sedated grizzly bear, tattooed the inner lips of mule deer, all sorts of, you know, sort of fun experiences. But in doing all of that, I also realized that they're not the ideal sort of study organism if you want to do experiments. And so that's how I landed on mice, somewhere in between cockroaches and grizzly bears. Mm -hmm. That's a good title, Nels, between cockroaches <laughs> and grizzly bears. Yeah, we might have to rethink the title <laughs> of the show. <laughs> Where'd you go to uh, grad school? So I went to the University of Washington. It was the only place I applied, um, which is not what I recommend to most of my undergraduates these days. Um, and I worked initially with um, Jim Kanegi, who was the mammal, or I guess recently retired, but was the mammal curator there in the Burke Museum, their Natural History Museum. And in my first few years, um, this was at a time, it's hard to imagine this, but um, when me molecular markers were f sort of first coming on the scene in terms of folks who are interested in organismal biology. So, you know, using molecular markers to study migration um, between populations or biogeographical patterns and so forth. And so, you know, I remember taking courses like, you know, about what's a microsatellite and how do we test variability in microsatellites in this organism or that organism. And so I got really drawn into that sort of field of molecular ecology and, that coincided with the appearance of um, Scott Edwards, who also had a Berkeley connection. He had done his um, PhD at Berkeley in their Natural History Museum, and he started as a new faculty and was this young hotshot professor. And I sort of knocked on his door and said, can I work in your lab? I know you work. he, he works on birds. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm pretty sure I don't want to work on birds, but could I still work in your lab? And um, I think in part because I had a fellowship that – so he didn't have to pay me, and in part because he was interested in populating um, his lab, I sort of squeezed in the door and uh, ended up working with him for the next uh, five years. Mm. What was your project on? So where Scott's interest and mine overlapped was um, an interest in understanding how sex chromosomes evolved. And so I worked on this pretty – it was a pretty fun project, um, and I'll maybe – take a moment to tell you a little bit how it started because sometimes I, f I feel like, you know, 
there's all these fun stories and how projects start and they don't always start the way most people envision mm. them, right? So <laughs> yeah, I was point. interested in sex chromosomes and but I didn't really know what organism to look at and how I was going to start studying this. And so as a first step, I thought, well, there's this this gene had just been discovered that it was when the sex determining gene SRY was discovered on the Y chromosome, it's sort of the trigger for the male pathway. So if you, even if you have a Y chromosome, but you, this SRY gene isn't working, the default pathway is female. So this was this new gene and it was pretty interesting. And I got excited about the Y chromosome in part because people had been really focusing on mitochondrial DNA, which of course is inherited through the female lineage. So we knew a lot about female movement and so forth. And I always thought, well, let's, you know, a nice balance would be to see maybe males and females move differently in populations. Anyway, so I got excited about the Y chromosome and this particular gene. So the way I started my project was just to ask, you know, which in which species can I actually amplify this gene? And this was again, <laughs> in the, this is dating me, the old days I was doing Southern blots. <laughs> so I called up Jim Patton, the curator of mammals at um, Berkeley, and I said, can you just send me a whole bunch of tissues from a whole bunch of male rodents? And the reason I ended up studying these South American field mice is because it gave me the best results on my southern blot. <laughs> and that was that. Was that. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes the way things work, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, and then and then you know, so then I started reading about this um, this particular group of mice, and what was per particularly interesting to me is that um, in the old days, again, <laughs> I'm feeling older and older. Um, the uh, the way that systematists were classifying new species was by looking at their karyotypes. And so, you know, if you had the same karyotype, you're most likely part of one species or species complex. And one of the things that they had noticed was that they would go out in the field and catch some uh, of these field mice down in South America, let's say Argentina, and uh, it would look just like a female, it would have litters and so forth. But when they looked at the karyotypes, they had an, a normal X chromosome, and then they'd have what they referred to as a, um, a small X or a, a deleted X. So it was sort of like they had a normal looking X and a little X. And it turned out later, they realized that that little X was actually um, a Y chromosome. So in other words, there were females that were XY, which, you know, they should be males if everything worked correctly. And so my, my thesis really focused on understanding how that evolved and how that could be maintained in populations and, and so forth, which was really fun. It was a big evolutionary puzzle. Yeah, and sort of in sort of mixing the evolutionary puzzles with the technologies and the uh, molecular yeah. approaches that were emerging, it seems like that's a theme that continues to bubble up and uh, go, go on in interesting new ways. Yep, I think that's right. What did you do next, Hopi? Okay, so I had um, this interest in sort of molecular methods to address organismal questions, and this my thesis, while super fun, I, I really like it was I was solving this mystery, but it was a mystery that you know probably I was the only one really interested in, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know how how South American field mice why they're X Y females in the in the populations are, um, and so I wanted to I mean part of it I guess was Maybe the better way to tell the story is to say, you know, we were using things like microsatellites and mitochondrial DNA, and we're always using these sort of neutral molecular markers um, to learn something about the biology of a particular group or species. And as a postdoc, I decided I wanted to study the other part of the genome, the part of the genome that sort of mattered for the phenotype and maybe fitness. And so I did a um, postdoc with Michael Nachman, then at the University of Arizona, who had um, been thinking for a number of years and started working on this really interesting case in which there were mice that live out there in the deserts of Arizona, New Mexico, northern Mexico, that are these sort of sandy colored mice. They live on these gr granitic um, rocky outcrops. But um, in some areas, there are these also these volcanic, um, basically lava flows that um, are out there. And geologists have been studying them, and they, we know something about their age, and they range from a few thousand years to several tens or hundreds of thousands of years. And these are sort of like 
black rocky islands in an otherwise sort of tan granitic um, sea. And when you trapped mice on these uh, lava flows, the the same species of mouse was uh, black. Um, mm. And so the obvious um, sort of hypothesis was that they were black because they blended into their surrounding environments, making them less visible to visually hunting predators. And um, this was, you know, work, these mice were first described in this beautiful natural history work in the early 1920s or so. And anyway, so um, Michael was really keen, and I think this was just such a, a, a brilliant idea, to try to understand the molecular changes responsible for that very simple adaptation. And so I got to come into that project um, relatively um, early on and go out in the field and trap mice and, you know, work with some candidate pigmentation genes and uh it was like my dream project so is it is there a predator that uh, would give an advantage to being black so the, one of their main predators are sort of uh owls mm -hmm. and hawks and yeah. things, and things like that um they also i uh, have to admit there are also rattlesnakes that are uh, major predators but mm -hmm. not it's unclear how important color is to the rattlesnakes but uh the the rattlesnakes come into play when we think about doing field work. So you're walking around on these lava flows and you've set a bunch of mouse traps that, um, you know, mice have been in, living in overnight at various stages and so forth. So they're, they smell like mice. So they're really attractive to these rattlesnakes. And the rattlesnakes also have predators um, and have evolved this camouflaging melanic color, which makes them incredibly difficult to see. So when we get up in the morning and check our mouse traps, we have to be very careful not to step on the rattlesnakes, which have been attracted <laughs> to the mice mouse traps, but that are beautifully camouflaged in these lava flows. So you ever it's always interesting. Did you ever step on one? I never stepped on one, but I certainly have stepped near them. And I have to say those rattles um, come in handy, <laughs> you know, right <laughs> yeah. away if you're near and can back off. You know, speaking of snakes, have you seen that uh, snake iguana movie from uh, oh Plan my God. Planet yeah, Earth? from the new Attenborough. Oh. I saw video. the video. That is a oh. stressful video. <laughs> it, it is amazing. <laughs> I was I was sitting in my office rooting for the iguana. Go, go. I know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He made it. <laughs> Or she. <laughs> That's right. Well, it sounds like some of your formative years in uh, Yellowstone, um, you know, putting thermometers in unspeakable places and grizzly bears might have served you well. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least um, I think it sparked my interest in uh, being out in the field. Um, and, you know, if you're going to study adaptation, I think it's really important to get out there in the field and see what the organisms are adapting to. And, um, it's it's really a, a nice component to the work we do. And for me, I have to say, when you go out in the field, you sort of unplug. And it's a really nice time to both think and think carefully about science. And um, often would go out in the field these days with, um, you know, my graduate students and postdocs. And I have to say, you get to know people in a completely different way mm. when you're, you know, <laughs> eating beans out of a can and, you know, talking about rattlesnakes and so forth. Mm. It's an aspect that Nels and I don't really have in our work, right? Well, that's right. But so then as a sort of, you know, lab rat, so to speak, another strategy is to think about your immediate environment. And, and so can you, if you have a, if you're at an institution that's been dropped into the foothills of the Wasatch Mountains, for yeah, example, yeah, sure. and then you can escape and maybe get a taste of that. I suppose. But uh, what, what Opie <laughs> is saying is, uh, I mean, I just read The Beak of the Finch, right? Where Ooh, mm -hmm. yeah. these two individuals and their students and postdocs just would hang on this tiny island for months at a time, just, yeah. you yeah. know, all day just observing things and writing them down and you have a lot of time to think. Yep, that's right. That's you know, that yeah. that book I read when I was a... Uh, um, an undergraduate in mm -hmm. the end of my, and I have to say, I, I wanted to grow up and be Rosemary uh, Grant. I just thought she was very cool. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. Sort of like a next generation, um, Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey type. Yep. Um, yeah. It was very, to me, very glamorous. I, the, the fellow who wrote the book, Jonathan uh, Weiner yep. is a professor here at Columbia. That's the, right. He's in the journalism school. And I, I give a lecture in his course every spring. Huh. <laughs> and I always say, you know, you write so beautifully. Yes. Uh, I, I feel badly teaching in his course. <laughs> when it contaminated, but, uh, yeah. The writing is so beautiful. If, if anyone has yeah. not read it, I 
highly yeah. recommend it. It's just, you know, yes, go ahead. Uh, he has also written um, a beautiful book on um, sort of the history of behavioral genetics that I give to my students when they first join the lab. And I think The Beak of the Finch has gotten the most attention, but this other um, book, it's super um, dense. It's called Time, Love, and Memory. And it's about the, you know, the first mutations that have a behavioral phenotypes that were characterized in, in Drosophila. So yeah, he starts with yeah. Seymour Benzer in his lab. I just, right. I think it's such a fantastic book, but um, less less well it known is. than Beak of the Finch. It's funny. I was talking with David Quammen, who's a science writer mm -hmm. in Montana, and he was telling him how much I loved Beak. And he said, you should try the one you've just mentioned. Yeah, oh, he, good. He thinks it's even better, right? Yeah. Right, right. I have to get that. Yeah, for sure. I'll send you a copy. I have I have a stash. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I think in your postdoc, it seems like the beginnings of an interest in melanocytes began, right? Yes. Which That's lasts right. till this day. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, we, you know, I keep thinking someday I'll, I'll stop studying pigmentation, but every study you do opens up new questions and they're yeah. hard to let go. Yeah. Where did you go out of your postdoc, Opie? So uh, after I left Michael's lab, I was there for three years and then I moved to UC San Diego mm -hmm. and was started my lab there and um, thought I would spend my career there, um, but it turned out that um, I stayed there for three years and then was recruited to Harvard. Um, and uh, never thought I'd live on the East Coast. This is all new to me, snow and <laughs> you know, all, all of the <laughs> things that go with that. The grumpy people. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a different, a different feel. Although, you know, I have to say, I've been here ten years, almost precisely. Um, the start of this term is my ten-year anniversary at Harvard, and um, oh. I've really come to love, especially Cambridge. Um, but anyway, the so I started uh, there at San Diego, and we started working, continuing our work and interest in pigmentation biology, but switched from these desert-dwelling rock pocket mice to another group of mice that now dominate our our research, uh, although not exclusively in the lab, and those are deer mice in the genus Paramiscus. And, and we've been studying their pigment and uh, skeletal traits and, and now behaviors uh, for 13 years or so. So when you mentioned Paramiscus, as a virologist, I immediately mm. think of hantaviruses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. We do have to worry about hantavirus and get to wear um, these not so glamorous spacesuits in the field and masks yeah, yeah. and so forth. Um, yeah, they, yeah, I think about thirty percent of the population are, are virus positive. So uh, yeah, you have to be careful. I, I spoke to a fellow in Vermont who works on them, and he, this is very interesting. He actually set up colonies outdoors where he would dig holes in the ground and sink a 55 gallon drum in and then hmm. the mice would go in there and it would be covered they can't get out of course and he could study them right outside right oh and, interesting and any infections and transmission he could study but he, i said you know how did, he said well I, I i dug the holes myself it's a big hole you know a 55 <laughs> gallon drum yeah no kidding yeah but sure. he said we have to when he studies them he has to use the bsl3 suits and respirators because it, uh you can get infected. Yep. Yeah, it's a respiratory yep. transmitted virus. Yep. yep. Yeah. It's one of my worries when my students go out. But so far, we've been uh, hanta free which is great. That's good. And so do you have a field operation then, moving from the desert mice to the um, deer mice? Yep. So we um, initially, we spent a lot of time working. On, so, you know, this is, in retrospect, quite a clever change, but it was really driven by the biology, which nobody believes once I tell you where we, we started to work, is we went from these, you know, deserts of Arizona where it's hot and there's rattlesnakes and cacti and <laughs> border patrol and helicopters following us in the, in the deserts. And uh, we moved to the... Um, uh, the Gulf Coast of Florida, where we work on the on the beaches, <laughs> and it's just uh, it's it's ridiculously beautiful, and especially in February when you know the snowstorms really start to hit Cambridge, um, we head off to Florida. Um, but most recently, we've been working in Nebraska and have actually built a number of outdoor enclosures and can monitor sort of mouse populations both their phenotypes and genotypes through time. Um, and that's been a really fun, uh, a fun project working in um, Valentine, Nebraska, where we've really um, integrated ourselves into the, the town. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system and setting the highest standards for ingredients and finally building 
a community of home chefs. Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Every meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients. You can do them all in 40 minutes or less. If you spend a lot eating out or at high-end grocery chains, you can now spend under $10 per person for healthy home-cooked meals. I have to say, I love to eat. I'm not a fan of cooking because I don't like getting all the stuff together. And I love Blue Apron. I tried it out last week. Man, it's really easy. They give you everything you need except salt, pepper, and oil. You know, all the spices that you'd need, you'd have to go out and buy a whole bottle of them. They send them to you, and they're fresh. The meats are fresh. The fishes are fresh. Man, I just love it. I thought our listeners would really like this, too. You know, I approve what ads we do, of course. And uh, Curiosity Stream was, of course, obvious for Twix listeners. But this one I like because I think everyone likes to eat. Not everyone likes to cook. And uh, you can save money. You're not going to gain weight because it's, it's it's a fixed amount of food, not a huge amount. And you can only eat that and, and nothing more. And it's fun to cook. Now, Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for their community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. For example, seafood is sourced under standards developed in partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch for sustainability. Beef, chicken, and pork come from responsibly raised animals. And produce is sourced from farms that practice regenerative farming. And this is what I like. Because they ship the exact amount of each ingredient required for a recipe, they reduce food waste. You can customize your recipes every week depending on your dietary preferences. You can choose a delivery option that fits your needs. They're very flexible. No weekly commitment. You only get deliveries when you want them. And tonight, I'm expecting a box to be delivered at home, and I can't wait to get it and start cooking. I don't tell them what to send me. I let them pick, so I'm surprised. It's really cool. They deliver, by the way, to 99% of the continental U.S. You can choose from a variety of new recipes every week, or you can let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you, which is what I like to do. Last week, we had... Chicken souvlaki with roasted broccoli. Ah, oh, it was so good. And there's more to it, but I can't remember. And we had crispy salmon with Meyer lemon aioli. And each meal comes with side dishes. For example, here's some examples. By the way, they never repeat a recipe in a year, so you're not going to get bored. Can you imagine? Every week you can have something different. Spicy shrimp and Korean rice cakes with cabbage and furikake. Pork chops and garlic piccata with scallion rice and spinach. Cashew chicken stir fry with tango mandarins and jasmine rice. You can see there's always a main just and a couple of sides. Oh, they make my mouth water. I shouldn't record this so late because <laughs> I'm hungry. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash T-W-I-E. I think now's a good time now for us to dive into this paper, don't you think? Yeah, good idea. So we're um, <clears throat> still thinking about mice and rodents, but we're shifting into a whole other uh, location, I guess, the African striped mouse. So what got you, we're talking about this paper that just came out from your lab, uh, I think around Thanksgiving, uh, article in Nature titled Developmental Mechanisms of Stripe Patterns in Rodents. So, and what got you onto this question about stripe evolution, uh, kind of considering what we've already talked about? Yep. So the the work we the work I did as a postdoc was sort of a mouse changing from completely sort of a sandy brown color to black, and then when we switched to working on these beach mice, um, there was a real interest in what gives rise to differences between color on the belly versus the back, because that seemed to be what was driving a lot of the change that camouflage them in their local environments. But both of those are pretty simple changes in color, you know, whole body changes or belly to back changes. And so the project really came out of an of the interest in understanding, you know, how more complex patterns um, arose. Mm -hmm. um, and was really a, a postdoc who um, named Marie Manso, who's now a PI at the College de France in Paris, 
um, who got excited about these striped mice. So I had visited a collaborator in at the university, well, who's now a collaborator, but I was visiting the University of Zurich, and he had been is a, he's a behavioral ecologist who's been working on these striped mice because they're diurnal. So they're like the meerkat equivalent in the rodent world. So you mm. can watch these mice and give them numbers and so forth. But of course, when I saw the mice, I saw, look at those stripes. They're amazing. <laughs> um, and so Marie went out to his lab and collected some embryos and some um, some skin samples and brought them back. And we got excited about them because um, – what Karsten Schraden, this behavioral ecologist, had discovered is that they breed wonderfully in the lab, which opens mm. up a whole suite of possibilities. So we often get asked, well, why didn't you work on chipmunks? You could just go out and you know, we could collect them on mm. campus. Um, mm. But they don't, they're, they're very difficult to maintain in the lab. So this was sort of like the, the lab equivalent of a, of a chipmunk. Mm. Yeah, interesting. So and it seems pretty clear from the earlier work how you know, coat color, obviously sort of camouflaging or blending into those volcanic rocks would make sense as a fitness advantage. But what's going on here with the stripes? What would, what, what's, could be, a, could be the possible evolutionary sort of undergirding of that? That's a great question. And, and, you know, to be frank about it, we don't have any, I would say, solid experimental evidence to mm. sort of tell you about the First, whether or not there is a fitness effect, and then second, what's driving that. Um, But what I can tell you is um, two things. Um, One, there's a strong correlation between striping patterns, certainly in rodents, and being diurnal. So most of the things, the rodents that um, are running around in the daytime, many of those have stripes. And by contrast, I I always hate to say none, but Mm. very few, if not none, that are nocturnal um, have stripes. So there's this correlation with, you know, being running around um, and being diurnal and having diurnal predators. Mm. Um, And then second, there have been some actually very eloquent, elegant, how how ironic is that? (laughs) Not (laughs) eloquent way to say elegant. Um, Could be both. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Studies in uh, snakes that have shown that these longitudinal longitudinal, um, stripes actually are important for... um, evading predators. And so it's something about not being able to tell where the head and the end is that makes it very difficult for predators to zero in and actually catch um, one of these um, snakes. And so while those studies have obviously not been done in in mice, one could imagine something similar happening in in mice. Mm -hmm. Is it only um, four-legged animals that have stripes? I was trying to think about this. Oh, um, nope. So you can think about birds as another... Mm-hmm. Good example. Yeah. Um, so Marie, this postdoc who sort of got this project off the ground, her lab now focuses on pigmenta- pigmentation patterns in birds. Mm-hmm. Fish certainly have stripes. Mm-hmm. Lizards have stripes. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess lizards have four legs too, but um, fish <laughs> certainly don't. I guess yeah. insects are striped too, some of them. Oh, lots yep. Of them. There's some, you know, I have to say there's a Drosophila species, and I, I'm going to forget the species, that has these same African striped mouse like stripes on its back, mm. which I thought was pretty mm. cool. Yeah. But in, but anyway, yep, they seem to be um, fairly fairly common. And is there any? Po- I mean, so it seems like the predator potential link is makes could make a lot of sense. Is there any um, possibility that it could also be something of, with just species identifying each other, or something along the lines of um, you know information within species or communication that way through a pattern, or is that less likely? I think I, I think it's possible. Um, I would say if I had to, if I had to guess, I would say it's a little bit less likely because rodents in particular tend to be a little bit more um, olfactory driven when we think about mate choice. But that's not you know that's a hand waving sort of guess. Um, mm-hmm. So all I can say is there's no evidence that I know of that um, stripes are important for, for example, species um, recognition or mate choice. Thinking then about the question, I guess. So you have this really cool system. The African striped mouse, they breed well, so they they might be good for studies. What? So then, how did you think about you know what's next, or what was what was the question that, that you wanted to pursue with this study? Yeah. So um, I think that 
what was fun about this particular system is that we could ask two very complementary questions. And one was sort of a developmental question of how do these stripes form? So, you know, the idea of how different uh, parts of an organism are patterned, I think, is a really important question, the basis of developmental biology. And here we had a nice, visible um, way to look at a pattern. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, as an evolutionary biologist, we were also interested in the second question, and that is, how do these patterns evolve? And so, by working on this question, we could sort of do both the evo and devo um, sort of parts of our interests. Yeah, it's really nice. And so maybe we could, we could go a little farther on this idea. Like, why is it important to consider sort of the development pr developmental process? So at the outset of the paper, yeah. in the first few figures, it seems like you devoted a lot of attention to sort of mapping out when and how these patterns emerged. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, one of one of the things we were really interested in is asking, you know, at a very practical level, when are there changes in, let's say, gene expression that give rise to these, um, ultimately give rise to these patterns that we see in adults? And so if one of the first things we had to do was simply characterize when do we first see these stripes? Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is certainly when the mice are born that you can already see these um, this this beautiful longitudinal stripes um, on the mice. And as you go even back a little bit into late embryogenesis, you can see the stripes um, starting to form in embryos. And so what that meant to us is that there's something that happens during embryogenesis that sets the stage for these stripes to appear. And so that gave us a sort of time point to start to probe um, for the causal, you know, what are the causal things that are giving rise to these stripe patterns. Uh huh. And I guess it's both just even, you know, looking at the embryos and the earlier developing mice um, visually, but you're also um, considering molecular markers. So, how, and how do you pick those markers or, and kind of think about that balance? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that we could take advantage of is that pigmentation has been studied for, you know, over a century, and um, there are a lot of tools available, a lot of these markers that allow us to, for example, differentiate a young from a mature melanocyte or a melanoblast from a melanocyte. And so these are um, sort of readily available markers that give us a sense of the underlying um, cell biology that will ultimately give rise to the mature melanocyte that will make the pigments that give rise to the differences in the hair pigments that give us this this beautiful stripe pattern. So I think it's important for us to mention that this is these stripes are due to hair pigmentation differences, right? Right. So one of the first things that we we when I say we, I mean Marie and Ricardo did. Um, so Ricardo, so Marie is the one who sort of started the project, and then this was um, really uh, then driven by Ricardo Malarino, who's a current postdoc in the lab. Um, and what they did was they went down to our natural history museum into the sort of bowels of the museum into the mammal department and started pulling open drawers <laughs> um, and looking, and you can pull out these museum specimens. We had this particular African striped mouse um, in our collection and they could look at the individual hairs and how those were pigmented. And so, you know, it, one can think of a, of a chipmunk in the sense that they have essentially a black, if you start at the midline of the back, um, which is sort of a grizzly color, and then they have a black stripe, a white stripe, a black stripe, and then you have the grizzly colored flank, and then a light colored, almost white belly. And so you can look at the individual hairs in each of those stripes, and the white stripes had hairs that didn't have pigment, the black stripes had hairs that were mostly with black pigment, as you may expect, and then those parts that we refer to as grizzly, grizzly had white hairs, black hairs, and then um, a banded hair that has black at the tip and the base and a yellow colored pigment called pheomelanin. And so they spend some time sort of characterizing the phenotype because then the question becomes what gives rise to the differences in the pigmentation patterns on the hairs as opposed to something that's more macro like the straight mm. pattern. Okay. So then... So, you, I mean, this is, just sounds like a really cool confluence then between, I mean, going to the history museum really defining the phenotypes and then combining that I guess with those molecular markers that you already described and so then you move pretty quickly now that you've characterized um, this both at the sort of visual and then molecular level that seemed like that gave you the opportunity to then to move to transcriptome analysis 
um, of skin samples. So maybe tell us about these experiments or how this how you're thinking about that and set that up. Yep. So I think that so we characterize the pigmentation pattern. We learn that the pattern is established during embryogenesis, and then we ha- we asked um, a very simple question, which was. So melanocytes, which are the cells that produce pigments, um, arise from the neural crest, so sort of the midline of the back, and then they migrate around the around the body. And so some of the pigmentation patterns that we see in nature are because melanocytes don't migrate properly or they migrate differently. And so you have things like a white splotch, for example, simply because the melanocytes don't get there. So we asked a very simple question, are these white stripes just caused by the fact that there are no melanocytes there? Well, it turns out using some of these molecular markers, we could show the melanocytes are there and they're evenly distributed across black stripes and white stripes and belly and so forth. Mm. And what this led us to then um, imagine is that there's probably something going on in terms of um, what's regulating these spatial differences that may be transcriptional. And that led us to then think about ways we could characterize differences in the transcriptional activity in emerging light versus dark stripes, or what I'm referring to as white white stripes. Can I ask you a, a stupid question? Sure. Um, so the idea is that the, um, the melanocytes produce melanin, which would then mm-hmm. diffuse into the hair shaft, and, and that would determine whether it's light or dark, the amount of That's right. But all the mel- melanocytes are everywhere, so it's not just their distribution. You know. That's right. Okay. Got it. Yep, that's exactly. So we started off with the, probably the you know most simple question of you know are do they have white stripes because there are no melanocytes so you can't produce yeah. pigment and that's why the hairs are, are white, but they have melanocytes and and plenty of them. Um, but and it's, I guess it sounds like a simple question, but it's actually a pretty surprising result, isn't it? True that in other cases it's how you're describing that the melanocyte distribution is actually quite different, and this is a yep a certainly new so yeah. Yeah. so um, so people have. Uh, cats that are black that have, they're called sort of, I think, uh, tuxedo cats, right? So they have this little white blotch on their chest. Mm. Um, That white blotch often is because the melanocytes that are migrating from your back all the way around and usually come together on your belly (laughs) don't quite make it. And so Mm. the blaze of a horse often on their sort of forehead is also caused by this sort of incomplete migration of melanocytes. Mm. Um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, what I don't know is how often you get this. I mean, this is a very beautiful, tight stripe that we see um, on these mice. And so maybe, at least to me, it wasn't so surprising it wasn't a melanocyte migration problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, we needed to, sh- to show that first. But Yeah, and, and maybe we should say, is just so if it's worth it to grab this paper and just look at the um, figures. So the, in figure one, just to see how sort of the, I mean, it almost from uh, a, a novice's eye, it looks like you are working with chipmunks, but um, <laughs> that, <laughs> that doesn't come into play until later. But um, but yeah, it's it really is a striking pattern. It's beautiful, Although, as you say, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that gave you the, I guess that gave you the footing then to think about this now kind of in a new way at the genomic level or the transcript level and thinking about what might be different in these different regions of dark and light stripes. Is that sort of how That's- things emerged or... That's exactly right. And so my postdoc, Ricardo, said, well, why don't we dissect out light and dark stripes and do RNA-seq experiment and look at the different numbers of transcripts from genes that are expressed in the skin and see if there are differences between the two. And I I have to admit, I was really hesitant about this experiment because any two bits of skin or tissue that you take, you're going to see, you know, potentially hundreds of genes that are differentially expressed. And then how do you get down to the actual genes that are causing the difference you're interested in? So, you know, I was a little bit hesitant. He he said, well, you know, look, we'll just do a few mice and let's see. And and he convinced me to to give it a go. And I'm I'm very glad he did because he was exactly right. (laughs) So what he did was he, and this is sort of painstaking. So you have these little mouse embryos and and you could dissect out the black stripes and a little tissue from a light stripe, and then we did the flank as a control. And you can even do this um, before you actually see the stripes emerging because there are some differences in the skin that are predictive of where the stripes are going to be. And then you can simply ask what genes are more highly expressed or in white versus black or in black versus white. 
And when we did that, um, what we saw were a number of pigmentation genes that we expected. So things that are associated with making dark eumelanin were overexpressed in the black stripes, and some things that are associated with pheomelanin or less pigment um, were highly expressed in the lighter regions. But of all the genes we looked at, there was this one standout that was the most differentially expressed of all. And I had been studying at that point pigmentation for, you know, well over a decade. And this was never a gene that I had come across in the pigmentation literature. So mm. we were excited about the signal, but not quite sure what to make of it. And so we did a little bit of validation and so forth. And Ricardo jumped into the literature and we started to get some really cool hints. Mm. So, so this is a gene that was way up in light skin, right? That's right. So it's overexpressed in light skin, and that's whether you compare it to black stripes or to flanks. And importantly, this diff signal of differential expression occurred before the stripes, we could actually see the stripes. Mm. And that made us mm. think that maybe this is something that's important in establishing the stripes or at least ha occurred early on in stripe formation. And then, you know, we did a little jumping up and down in the lab and uh, <laughs> got all excited about it, and yeah. Ricardo jumped in the literature. This this <laughs> figure you have, the differential transcript expression, like, I mean, it's just gorgeous. There's this one dot way yeah. to the right, and there it is, <laughs> LX3. That's right. <laughs> yeah, this, vol this volcano plot. Yeah. You can really see why that would be the one. And I guess it's, I mean, it sounds like two things really – helped having those comparative the comparison to the flank region but then also having done the developmental biology that that gave you some confidence that you were kind of looking at the right place at the right time right so after this gene sort of popped out Ricardo started looking at, you know, what do we know about this gene ALX3? And it's a transcription factor um, that is related to the paired gene in Drosophila. So a lot of developmental biologists know about the paired um, gene in Drosophila. And, you know, it had been fairly well studied, this kind of group of um, transcript or this gene family. Um, ALX3 in particular had been studied in um, craniofacial and axial skeletal development. And so we kept, we sort of you know, scratched our heads a bit because in this field, one of the classic things you do if you're studying a developmental gene is you knock it out or you overexpress it and look at the phenotype. And we thought, well, certainly somebody's done that. And, and indeed they had, but there had never been reported a, a pigmentation phenotype. And that's something that, you know, the mouse is born and you see it. There's no like, oh, I didn't happen hmm. to notice it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we thought, well, that's not good until um, Ricardo realized that Almost all of the studies in the context of um, skeletal development occurred in a strain of mouse that was albino. <laughs> so if it had a pigmentation phenotype, we wouldn't you wouldn't see it because they can't make um, mm -hmm. pigment. Mm -hmm. And so that solved that mystery. So we got over mm -hmm. that hurdle um, initially. But um, the next thing Ricardo did was to ask, okay, so we saw this differential expression, but is it expressed sort of in the right place or where is it expressed? Mm -hmm. And in laboratory mice, ALX3 in the skin is expressed in the belly. So that was interesting, and especially interesting because um, at least the strain of lab mice we were using have light-colored bellies. So that was correlated with what we thought. You know, you saw high ALX3 expression in the white stripes of these mice. But what was much more interesting and convincing was that when we looked at uh, the expression of ALX3 in developing striped mouse embryos. It's expressed in the belly like lab mice, but there's also these two little patches of expression that are symmetrical on the dorsal side of the mouse up near the midline. That's exactly where you would predict the white stripe would form. Hmm. Um, so that all of a sudden was, that was another time in the lab we did some jumping up and down because um, <laughs> it was sort of, that's exactly what, you know, we would would have hoped to see or expected to see if this was involved in stripe formation. And then the final thing we did was, uh, at least in this part of the story, is to show mm -hmm. that ALX3 is expressed in the melanocytes themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have a gene that affects the production of pigmentation, the uh, place to be would be in the cells that actually make the pigment. Mm -hmm. So then it seems like the story here takes kind of an unexpected twist where we're in the you know context of the whole mouse, but then you guys pursued some cell culture experiments. What, what was the idea behind that? Yeah. So everything that I've told you so far, that ALX3 is highly expressed in regions with light hairs from the RNA-seq, that mm -hmm. through doing in situs, we showed it's expressed in what 
one could imagine would become the white stripe region in an adult, and it's expressed in melanocytes. There are all these really tempting correlations. But what we really wanted to do was show causation. So we had this hypothesis that ALX3 somehow represses melan melanin synthesis or pigmentation th synthesis. So what we wanted to do was both gain of function and loss of function experiments and perturb the system and ask, okay, if you change ALX3 uh, expression, do you see a change in melanin synthesis in the direction you expected? Mm -hmm. So we did, an, we did a number of things in that um, regard. Um, so one of the things we could do is take advantage of this. I think this is one of the coolest techniques. It's called mm -hmm. ultrasound guided in utero lentiviral injections. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> isn't that just cool to say? Right? <laughs> so what, what that means is you use an ultrasound to guide your injection and you can inject into embryos that are within a pregnant mom mouse and inject uh, those embryos with a lentivirus. And in this case, we had a control lentivirus antivirus and one that expressed ALX3, that um, virus, the virus we used, um, was developed in uh, Elaine Fuchs lab at Rockefeller, and it nicely infects the skin, including melanocytes. And so here we could overexpress ALX3 in the melanocytes and then ask what happened to um, the cells, the melanocytes, and to pigmentation synthesis. And much to our delight, what we saw was that um, the results were consistent with ALX3 repressing melanocyte synthesis. Hmm. And it did Vincent, so in a... It, it, mm -hmm. Vincent, it always comes back to the viruses, doesn't it? <laughs> I keep trying to tell people, but... You know, yeah. that's a hard sell, but yeah. Well, once, you know, once people can use them for things like this, then yeah, everybody re yeah. recognizes their potential. But uh, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? They're just great delivery vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> they worked really, really well in, in this particular experiment. Yeah. We were very pleased yeah. with them. Yeah. So, and then there's another related experiment about, um, you know, this issue of whether kind of how this the, the mechanism of this activity, so this idea of whether it's cell non-autonomous versus autonomous. Could you tell us, what, first of all, what that means, actually, and then what you found? Yeah, so why we got excited about this in part was that a lot of um, what had previously been described as affecting pigmentation synthesis is sort of signals that come from outside of melanocytes, telling melanocytes um, what to do um, and what pigments to produce and how much and when and so forth. And here what it looks like is that it's a signal that occurs sort of within the um, melanocyte itself. So ALX3 being expressed in uh, in the melanocytes. And this is kind of, you know, so we, we did some studies where we try to isolate, sort of say, okay, if we take out the surrounding milieu of cells, including things like keratinocytes, do we still see this effect? And um, this was one of those experiments that we didn't do initially, but Ricardo and I presented this work at some at various meetings and always got asked this question of, do you know it's ALX3 acting on the melanocytes or is it signaling from neighboring cells that are um, important? And um, so those sort of repeated questions being asked by developmental biologists led us then, I can't remember, I'm trying to remember if a reviewer asked us to do this too, I can't mm, remember. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it was one of those add-on experiments that I think um, in the end we're very glad we did. So, you know, I guess it's one of those things you read the reviews and you, you see somebody says, well, I'd really like to see this one additional experiment and you kind of groan and uh, go back <laughs> in the lab. Of course. But in, yep. yeah, in this case, um, I think really allowed us to say this is an, a new mechanism that hadn't previously sort of been appreciated. And in, in particular, what we think is going on is that ALX3 is um, preventing or at least delaying the maturation of melanocytes. So the melanocytes get there, they differentiate from a melanoblast to a melanocyte, but never sort of mature to the point where they produce pigment, which gives rise to the white or unpigmented hairs. Um, mm. And so we sort of, what I, I don't know, one of the things I like is I want to figure out those little details of exactly how it works. Not just that the gene is expressed more highly and it's correlated with this, but like how yeah. is that high gene expression actually causing the phenotype mm -hmm. and so this was very very satisfying yeah that's neat and so i guess in that in that way then you would say that this is cell autonomous in the sense that you don't depend on sort of communication with other cells to gain that phenotype you can see it in the context of a single cell that's right or a group of cells i guess but yeah uh -huh. a group of melanocytes 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's right. So then I, from there, you returned back to the whole animal and started um, taking advantage of these great lentiviral constructs and tools to go back and manipulate it molecularly in that sense. So what did you find when you did when you kind of returned to the whole mouse? Yeah, so we did those gain that sort of lentiviral injections to overexpress ALX3 and showed that we could reduce melanin synthesis. And then we did the reciprocal or the complementary experiment of being able to um, knock out ALX3. And here we could rely on collaborators who had knocked out ALX3 for studies of skeletal development. So we have collab these wonderful collaborators in Spain. And um, so we just then had to get the knockout uh, genotype on a genetic background that could produce pigment. Um, mm -hmm. So that just required a, a just, it was many months of back crossing <laughs> and so forth. Um, <laughs> and then um, we could look at, at that effect. And um, what we found again was that um, as we expected, when you knocked out ALX3, there was more melanin that, w that was synthesized. So the mice, at least their bellies appeared darker. And that the belly phenotype makes sense. So if, again, this is one of those things we scratched our head for a minute and said, well, why is it just the belly that's darker and not the back? But remember, I told you earlier that ALX3 is expressed in the belly. This is done in laboratory mice, right? So yep. it's expressed in the belly of laboratory mice. So if you knock out a gene that's not expressed in the backs or the dorsum, then when you when you knock out that gene, you don't expect to see a phenotypic effect. And where you expect to see it, it is in the belly. Mm -hmm. So that ended up, you know, we, we had a number of these moments in this project where we sort of scratched our head. And then when you figure it out, it's that light bulb going on moment. And ah, oh, that's mm -hmm. exactly what we expect. And in fact, it's um, consistent with um, what we think may be going on. Mm -hmm. So those were really nice experiments and that convinced us that this gene was actually causal in some sense. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I guess one of the limitations here is that, I mean, you can do this, as you're mentioning, in the lab strains that have some pigment, but it's much more challenging to do that in the striped exotic yep. uh, African mouse. So if you could do that, I'm just kind of curious as a thought experiment, if you, you could have, if that did work, do you think by doing these manipulations that you could change sort of the striping patterns, either remove it or alter it in some way? Or what would, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, um, and I think this is something, you know, Ricardo will work on when he has a lab of his own, um, and that is just being able to do the transgenics in um, rhabdomies itself or striped mice themselves. Mm -hmm. And so what I would predict, if you could knock out ALX3, you'd get um, a darker color belly, and those stripes would no longer, they would have pigments in them. And so um, that would be really interesting. And then I'm thinking yeah. about the stripe pattern, and um, I think, so one of the things we didn't answer in this particular paper, which is an outstanding question, is, you know, what sets up the black stripes? Yeah. So yep. here we're really focused on the on the white stripes, and so, and what gives them, you know, what, I guess the other outstanding question is, what regulates ALX3? Why is ALX3 expressed in this mm. yep. um, mm. precise stripe pattern? Um, so if you wanted to maybe make a bigger stripe or make, move the, place of that stripe you'd have to figure out what's working up upstream of alx3 so i would guess it's that. i would guess it's a series of gradients of homeo box proteins right that are that are doing that and making the stripe maybe yeah <laughs> i mean you can't you can't go you can't keep going upstream at some point it has to stop right yeah, that's <laughs> you, get, you get to the top turtle, and that's it. That's it. Yeah, there's only <laughs> so far you could go. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it seems like you might. I mean, this is this paper is just keeps going and going with great yep. experiments. So from there, you um, might maybe there are some clues with sort of the next approach that you took, which is to start thinking about how the um, ALX3 is acting on the promoters of other genes that other transcription factors, I guess, in this case. And so what 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 was the idea here? Yeah, so this was really um, interesting as, you know, we again wanted to know sort of the molecular mechanism and get down into the details of how ALX3 actually affected pigmentation. And there were a series of like little, I would say little hints that led us to really focus on a gene called MIDF. Um, MIDF is what had always been sort of referred to as the top of the pigmentation um, cascade and had been fairly well studied both because it has a disease phenotype but also because of its sort of um, role as the master regulator of pigmentation, so to speak. Um, and so one of the things that we were really interested, oh, and uh, sorry, the, the other really important piece of the puzzle is that MIDF is required for melanocyte maturation, sort mm -hmm. of survival and differentiation. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so it fit with the phenotype of, you know, these melanocytes in the white stripes weren't maturing to produce pigment. And then, so with that in mind, the first thing we did was take our overexpression mouse and our mice and our loss of function knockout mice and asked, do we see a change in mid-F expression that would be consistent with ALX3 affecting mid-F? And indeed we did, and in the direction we expected. So that was a little bit of a leap, you know. There was We thought about it carefully and so forth, but um, there were other ways that this could have worked. But mm-hmm. what we mm-hmm. saw was that when you knocked out ALX3, mid-F went up, and when you overexpressed ALX3, mid-F went down. Um, and so that asked, led us to the question of how does ALX3 regulate mid-F? Is it directly or indirectly? And then that led into a number of... Um, uh, sort of experiments that uh, I think to me at least convincingly showed that ALX3 regulates mid-F directly um, and um, and that's what gives rise to the melanocyte phenotype. Uh, and I guess the evidence for that comes from you actually ask whether ALX3 binds to promoter motifs that are near the mid-F gene? Yep. Is that right? So yep. This, yep, this is a combination of EMSA, um, Chip Q PCR and some luciferase experiments that um, show that ALX3 binds to the upstream region of mid F. Um, so there's DNA protein binding both in vitro and in vivo. And then um, we could test for prom- promoter activity of these particular predicted binding sites using luciferase assays. Mm-hmm. So I was happy to see EMSA, which I didn't know that people still did <laughs> electrophoretic <laughs> mobility shift assays yeah you know these are one of these actually we didn't do them in our lab mm. um uh, but these were done by our collaborators in spain sometimes you know there are new fancy techniques that um can really move a field forward but there's a reason those uh, those early techniques um you know sort of got into the field and and, and in this case we didn't need to do anything fancy and so we just kept it nice and simple i guess Uh, you could argue that a chip would tell you the same thing you have an antibody to alx3 um, and that is bound to dna so you immunoprecipitate (laughs) and then you sequence the dna and it shows you the alx3 promoter so you know One could argue, but there's nothing like a visual assay, like a mobility shift, right? Shift, yeah. <laughs> that's right. I know, yeah, and we, we really wanted to cover all our bases, so that's why the, yeah. both EMSA and the chip seek, uh, the chip qPCR in this case, um, we decided to do both. The thing, you know, you say uh, we just, you know, it's easy enough to do, but you know, some some in some people's hands, EMSA could take them six months to mm. trouble you and get to work. Yeah. You never know. I, I would say that it's easy enough for our collaborators in Spain to do. <laughs> so it would have taken us. Six months, a year. I don't know. Ricardo's pretty good, though. He has really good hands. He probably could have handled it. But, um, yeah, not something I had done before. And so that's, you know, part of it is our yeah. collaborators were so wonderful. I mean, there, yeah. there is a series of experiments here which are just so thorough. Then the, then you even made mutations in the Tata motifs in, in ALX3, that ALX3 need to bind and show that it uh, abrogates the mobility shift. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's great. That's right. It's everything. I agree. Yep. Yeah. So then we've drilled all the way down to sort of, as you're saying, Vince, at the single point mutation level in these motifs. And then what's fun is it feels like then the paper comes all the way back yeah. to yeah. a much bigger <laughs> evolutionary question, which is what about chipmunks and or other <laughs> <laughs> other rodents that have yeah. these stripe patterns? And so maybe tell us about this, Hopi, and the, the um, convergent evolution that you're proposing. Yeah, so this again, you know, came about because we are associated with the Natural History Museum and pulling out these drawers and drawers of rodents. What, you know, was actually even surprising to me as a supposed mammal slash rodent expert is that there are lots of rodents that have stripes um, and it occurs in multiple families, but it's really clustered in two main families and that is the sort of mouse muridae, mouse rat family, and then the squirrel family, Skyuridae. And um, one of the things that's really, and those are, you know, so rodents are pretty, a pretty old group and fairly diverse. Squirrels and rodents are separated by about 70 million years. And what we have is a case where you have these African striped mice, which are murid rodents. Um, so more closely related to lab mice. And then 70 million years 
diverged are things like chipmunks. And these chip, if you look at the coat color patterns of the striped mouse and the chipmunk, they are very, very similar. You have the black, white, black stripe that's symmetrical on either side of the midline. Mm-hmm. And so we asked a very simple question of, is this same mechanism that we've described molecularly or developmentally in striped mice also sort of giving rise to stripes in chipmunks. And so here, um, what Ricardo, uh, Marie, and others in the, in the lab did was we could go out locally, tra- trap some chipmunks, and look at ALX3 expression in um, the skins of chipmunks. And what I still find <laughs> as quite remarkable is that you see the almost exact same expression pattern where ALX3 is expressed very low in the black stripes, sort of medium in the flank. And remember, the flank has some white stripes and then very high in the white stripes themselves, as well as the light colored belly. Um, And that led us to sort of conclude that it's probably the same general mechanism in ALX3 playing a very similar role in these highly divergent species. And because they're separated by 70 million years, it's probably not sort of a system or a mechanism that evolved 70 million years ago and was retained in these two lineages, but instead independently evolved in, in both groups. Yeah. And so I, it's a, it's really a cool observation and sort of, as you said, a simple question, but why would you say that's important or how does that help bolster the study to see sort of this um, evidence of independent acquisition of the same sort of biology or mechanism? So I think, you know, um, for so many years, folks have been studying the convergence at the phenotype level. Mm -hmm. And now that we're able to get down to the molecular and genetic mechanism, the question is, do we see the same genes being used over and over every time a trait evolves? Or are there many different ways in which we could generate, in this case, um, a striping pattern? So um, here we're showing that there's some, you know, conserved mechanism uh, that that gives rise to these um, stripes. And it's really fun to sort of, I don't know, I love this idea of answering these age-old questions about convergence, but now with a whole new set of tools and and some, you know, different level of precision and and so forth. Yeah, that's, yeah. What, that's what Tuivo is all about, right, Nels? That's right. <laughs> Seeing these things play out. Convergence. Levels of biological organization. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of that, have you looked at other um, are there other striped rodents that might be in the uh, sort of in the mix for even more examples of convergence, or is are these sort of the two that you would really hold up? Well, these two are the ones that are I would say most similar in this striping pattern. But you know, again, looking at across rodents and beyond rodents, you see things like golden mantled ground squirrels that have the black white black pattern, but instead of sort of on their top of their back, it's um, on their flanks, on their sides. So one could imagine that, you know, you just change the timing of ALX3 expression um, so that it doesn't occur early on, but maybe later on, and you get stripes on your side instead of on your back. And there are things um, like 13-line ground squirrels, which is the name implies, have 13 stripes down their back. So maybe instead of expressing ALX3 just in two stripes down the back, you express it in 13 stripes. And then finally, there are mice that are, I think, one of my favorite species. They're called zebra mice, which is a little bit misleading because you <laughs> think of them having stripes like a zebra that, uh-huh. you know, are vertical, but instead they're longitudinal and they're very common in Africa. Um, and they also have a number of stripes. So it's fun to think about how maybe just tweaking ALX3 expression can change the position or number or complexity of striping patterns. And I think that's an, o- an open question that Ricardo is really excited to to tackle. Is there any suggestion or evidence that ALX3 or a similar gene might control any kind of coloration, say, in um, primates? Oh, and primates, I thought you, I was sure you were going for the zebra (laughs) question. Yeah. Um, (laughs) That's, you know, we don't know yet. Um, So Marie Manso's lab is looking at birds to see if maybe this is involved in um, bird patterning. So Mm -hmm. things like emus, for example, when they're born, they have this beautiful black um, stripes um, that they then outgrow and develop an adult plumage. So we're definitely interested in looking at other species. We haven't approach mm. primates uh, yet. I mean, I know um, that primates are not striped, but, um, and I mean, maybe it's mm-hmm. simple the fact that, and this may be known, that different colorations are just simply uh, levels of melanin. Is that is that what that oh. is involved there? Yeah. So, well, so, you know, humans are pretty boring when it comes to pigmentation. Um, mm-hmm. 
in the sense that if you pull out one of your, you know any one of your hairs, um, if it's pigmented, yeah. um, it will have the same type of pigment. So your hair will be universally eumelanin, so brown to black depending on the concentration, or pheomelanin is sort of blonde to red. But if you have you know a cat at home or a dog at home and you you look at their hairs very closely, I don't know if you want to pluck them, but mm. <laughs> you look at them closely. In general, um, at least if you have you know a not all black or all white. Um, pet, uh, the hairs can have eumelanin at the base, then pheomelanin, and then a band of no pigment. And it really, you can mix it up. So you can imagine as the hair is growing, you have yeah, things, yeah. you know, these signals that come in and say, switch to this pigment, let's turn pigmentation off for a bit um, and get these neat patterns. So we, we're relatively boring in, in that sense. I've noticed that in our dogs. I, I find these mm-hmm. hairs and I go, what the mm-hmm. hell is that? It's gradient. <laughs> oh, it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the tips often are dark, and the yeah, base yeah. is different. And a lot of mammals, so um, most mammals, like the grizzly color you see in grizzly bears, because of this banding pattern on individual hairs. Yeah, very I, common. I wanted to make a comment about thirteen-lined ground squirrels because <laughs> yep. we did a paper on one of my other podcasts this week mm. in virology because these uh, squirrels have an endogenous RNA virus sequence in mm. them, which is not a retrovirus; it's a born of virus. Mm. <laughs> and there's some evidence that this piece of DNA, it's not the whole viral genome, makes protein that may protect them from infection. Interesting. Ooh. Yeah. So that's yeah. Thir- I, I remember the 13 line ground squirrel. That's Very squirrel. cool story. Yeah. <laughs> They're apparently super calm. If you're in the Midwest and at certain times of the year, they're sort of crawling all over the all over the place, um, which is great in terms yeah. of collecting in the field. But um, they're also uh, a model system for studying hibernation. Hmm. So oh, yeah. there's lab colonies, and and you know the government is interested in understanding these types of um, questions too. So for us, not only do they have these great stripe patterns, but because you can bring them in the lab and breed them and have some control over their environment, um, they really will make a nice um, system to address some of the, these questions. Well, from this, the- from this day on, I will have, because of your article, incredible respect for these striped rodents. <laughs> 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 and I should say appreciation because this is just yeah. a fabulous story. Of I course, agree. there's a lot to do. I mean, there are many, many questions. And I'm wondering... If you could just give us some uh, ideas about where you're heading with the with this story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I should say where Ricardo's heading because yeah. he's really the the mastermind behind this paper and and is really going to um, continue on with this um, work. And so what he is, I think, there's a number of questions. So we talked about some of them already. So of course we want to know what controls ALX3 expression. Um, so that's a question I think that he'll tackle um, early on. He is also in talks with folks about um, these zebra mice. Um, while those of us in the U.S. are probably less familiar with them, they're actually in the pet trade in uh, Europe. Um, so they're naturally from northern Africa. And turns out the U.S. doesn't like to import um, rodents from northern Africa or from Africa in general, but Europe, um, at least in the past, has. And so, um, you know, they happily breed in captivity and people have them as pets because they're so sort of cute and charismatic. Mm-hmm. So he'll, you know, go after some of the questions we talked about um, here not so long ago about, you know, does ALX3, you just express it in more domains and you get more stripes. And then I think that the other thing is a sort of more evolutionary question that um, I think I'm really interested in is, you know, ALX3 is a gene that I told you in laboratory mice, in striped mice, and we've also looked at a number of other mice, including um, rats, for example, that have light bellies. ALX3 is expressed in the bellies and is um, uh, correlated. And so one could imagine that sort of as an an ancient role, ALX3 played this ancient role in, in making bellies light. And then to make a stripe, you take that gene that makes light hairs in the belly and you just express it in a new spatial domain. So you co-opt it, it still does its same thing, it just does it at a different time and maybe uh, place and you can get this new stripe. And so we'd love to test that in a more um, uh, careful way, this idea that this is an example of co-option. Um, and I think that would be really fun. So again, you know, what's fun about this project for me is that we can ask these sort of hardcore developmental questions about mm. patterning and how does that work, but also these questions about that sort of inspire evolutionary biologists of how did this diversity evolve in natural populations. Yeah, wow, lots to do. And actually, you you know, when you mentioned the 13 line squirrel and the um, behavior of hibernation, maybe that gives me an opening to also ask. <laughs> 
um, you, as you were thinking about not only you know morphological patterning and things like this in your lab using rodents as systems, I mean, it seems like you have an incredible um, set of projects thinking about um, behavioral evolution as well. Could you touch a little bit on on that, even outside the bounds of this paper? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things I think that unites our lab is this question of um, what are the molecular changes that give rise to adaptations that affect fitness of rodents in the wild? And we tend to try to capitalize on all this variation that we see within and between rodent species. And as I mentioned sort of early on, one of the main workhorses in our lab are these deer mice in the genus Paramiscus, for some of the same reasons why Rhabdomys, um, these African striped mice, were of interest to us. We can bring them in the lab and breed them and um, do controlled experiments. And while we started on pigmentation and then have moved on and are continuing to work on um, other morphological traits, um, I don't know, now eight years ago or so, maybe longer, maybe, oh gosh, 10 years ago, <laughs> we started getting interested in using the same kinds of approaches that we use to dissect the molecular basis of morphological change to try to understand something about the genetics of behavioral variation. And just like a lot of the morphological traits that we study were first described in these old natural history papers, you know, these usually, you know, men who would go out and were associated with a museum and would go out in the field and catch a bunch of mice and bring them back as museum specimens and examine their different traits. They also often notice these behavioral differences between these mice. And so now um, if we find evidence that the behavioral differences have some genetic basis, we're able to we're starting to be able to um, identify genes that give rise to differences in uh, parental behavior, burrowing behavior, nesting behavior, um, exploratory behavior. We're studying a, a range <laughs> of factory <laughs> behaviors uh, in the lab, um, which has been really fun, challenging, really challenging, yeah. as you can imagine. We, you know, the brain compared to skin tissue, for example, is so much more complex. Um, but that is also what makes it really um, interesting and fun. Yeah, really great. Great stuff. Now, should we move on to uh, wrap up here? Let's do. As we promised an hour and a half. We're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't think I could talk for an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. Probably go have No problem. <laughs> Most, many <laughs> many of our guests say, "Wow, that was two hours already." In fact, uh, <laughs> Nels, when we were at Utah Live, uh, a lot of those right. the audience said, "I can't believe uh, an hour and forty five minutes went by so quickly." Yeah, it was, it's yeah, great. Conversations are the way to learn things. I'm convinced that they are very. It's a lot better than showing slides and droning on. You know. Yeah, I think you're on to something. Now, uh, I have a couple of emails here. Okay. And then we'll do some picks. One is from uh, Sumia, who writes, Hello, I'm not quite sure who reads this email, but I have to say that I really enjoyed the Twilight panel at the University of Utah Microbial Pathogenesis Retreat. Starting out with a panel changes the dynamic of a conference or symposium by making everyone accessible and making the dialogue more conversational. It was really cool to see that firsthand. I'm also going to recommend a similar panel layout to my PI, who is co-chair for a neuroimmunology conference next year. Also, I started listening to TWIV when I joined Tom Lane's lab. My background is in bioengineering and neural tissue engineering, and when I joined Tom's lab, I became infatuated with the new-to-me world of viruses, and TWIV was a great learning resource and has just been so fun to listen to. When I started listening to TWIV two years ago, I never thought I would get an opportunity to watch a live podcast recording. Thanks for an un unforgettable experience. Given that, I'm the first student who asked a question during the panel and just wanted to <laughs> let you know that I would like a TWIV mug. <laughs> Again, thanks for the awesome experience, Sumia. And uh, you got your mug, Sumia, I hope, I sent a while ago. It's someone from your institute right now. Correct. Yeah, well, and this is just exactly what you're talking about. So when you were here last month and we did our um, microbial pathogenesis uh, live podcast and had that conversation in person, not only a TWIV mug, but also a TWIVO mug is on the way. I've got a collection Good. of about a dozen of these locally, so I'll make sure to Wonderful. connect with Excellent. Yeah, yeah in fact, uh, I hope he went a couple of years ago. I was invited to be the keynote speaker for the Harvard Virology Retreat, and they asked me to do a podcast, not to give a talk, but to do a podcast. They wanted to see one uh, being done, and this is a, retre a retreat they have up in um, New Hampshire somewhere, somewhere up north there. That was a lot of fun. And then we have an email from Tarwin who writes, thanks as always for the amazing podcast. 
Is there an organization that is not connected to a specific institute that sponsors open access journal submissions? If not, would it be a good idea to start one, maybe with a Patreon or similar? It would require some kind of board that hands the money out as long as enough can be got per month to sponsor these papers. Just a thought regards Tarwin. Not aware of any. Are you, Nels? I'm not, but so this, um, you know, question of open access journals and just how we disseminate science is something that I know um, Hopi thinks about quite a bit as well. And are you, is it true, Hopi, are you involved in the bioarchive, for example? Um, it depends on how you define um, <laughs> involved. <laughs> okay. um, so I'm on the advisory board, um, but I'm also a big sort of proponent. And um, we've definitely, you know, just as a model, tried to put um, as many of our papers that seem to fit up on BioArchive before they're published. And I think it's just um, been a fantastic, we've had a fantastic um, experience and have gotten really good feedback, both from the preprints and then ultimately when the papers get published. Mm-hmm. Did you put this yeah. nature paper on BioArchive? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we ended up, we didn't put this on okay. uh, um, initially. Um, and yeah, for complicated reasons, but uh, well, you have almost to, every other paper has been on. <laughs> you have to satisfy all the authors, I would guess. And I can see that. that so we, we've just written mm-hmm. a paper and, um, you know, we're going to try and get it into a high profile journal and not everyone wants to send it to uh Archive, so I have to respect that. Of even though that would be my first choice, I'd love to get it out there right away. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, and just to say that there, I know certainly of examples of papers that are being published in the sort of traditional high impact places that where they have been on BioArchive to begin with, and so it's sort of a gray area right now yeah. of how yeah. how that may or may not work. Just maybe getting back to Tarwin's question a little bit. Um, I mean, what I would say is that it does seem like we're at a time with scientific publishing where the more experiments or the more things we try are not a bad idea. And so, um, and things will probably succeed, things will fail, things will change, but the more ideas and more kind of, I think, brain power we're putting towards how can we um, continue to improve or, um, you know, progress in how we communicate with each other as scientists, that's something that's really worth investing time and energy into. I think this is a good idea having, you know, an institute or foundation that sponsors, you know, because it costs money to to publish in an Oakman Access Journal, mm-hmm. and to have some uh, organization that will pay, it's great. But that's going to be work to do that. You're going to have mm-hmm. to have a board, and you're going to have to have someone running the Patreon, etc. Um, so, getting someone to do that or people to do that will not be trivial. But I think it's a great idea. It would really mm-hmm. be nice, especially for institutions that don't have a lot of money. And they want to publish in, in say, a PLOS or something. That's a good idea. Yeah, and especially when you start to drill down and think about what would it really take to do that. It, it can, I think it can really help give you an appreciation of what goes into this. Some of the things that we take for granted when we just yeah. send off our manuscripts to certain places and sort of hope or almost even expect that we'll get a answer from peers that is positive and very quick in a, yeah. a fast turnaround. Yeah. And so it really makes you realize how lucky we are. I think in many cases for what great systems that involve a lot of people um, being generous with their time um, to to allow the process to work as well as it already does. So if there's anyone out there who's interested, Tarwin, I know, <laughs> is a software developer. He may be willing to uh, develop the website that you'll need as an interface. And if you want, I can connect you. But uh, I certainly cannot because I have kind of my hands full with mm-hmm. Microbe TV. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, Nels, uh, let's do a couple of picks before we wrap it up. Sure. Science picks of the week. So um, my pick of the week, I kind of was suspecting, knowing a little bit of Hopi's background in California, that it might be fun to consider further this idea of how like, where you work um, can influence your science or um, and things like this. And so I've got a link to a video that I think is a great example of this idea of where you work and how that influences your career. So this is a video that comes from UC Santa Cruz, um, a little uh, south from UC Berkeley. But it's um, was put together to celebrate uh, Harry Knoller's 2017 Breakthrough Prize. And this prize that Harry got... Um, a month or so ago is for all of the work he's done now, as he points out in the video for um, his anniversary is 50 years doing structural studies on the ribosome, which he refers to as the mothership of life. (laughs) 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 And so I really like this video. It's only about four or five minutes, but there's some just really great 
um, conversations or in an interview with Harry where he's um, not only kind of talking about his zesty style and how he thinks about science, but he's also actually um, playing his saxophone as part of the music soundtrack, uh, jazz saxophone for the um, for the video. And I'll just lift up one of the um, lines that he has thinking about how his career, which has been, you know, at, at Santa Cruz working on the ribosome and its structural biology, how it relates to the RNA and the proteins interacting in really complex ways. He mentions that just doing this, it couldn't have been possible um, in his thinking to do this in, in a place or that wouldn't have been Santa Cruz for him. And part of it is that, you know, this is his lab is set in the campus there, which is sort of in the in the redwoods, in the wilderness. And he has one line where he says, even walking to the library is practically a religious <laughs> experience. And I, <laughs> I think it's just really great. It's fun. Anyway, fun to check that out. So Yeah, I can't say that I have that here. Wait, well, here walking to the library, uh, just wait for the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, 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 uh, sorry, go ahead. Well, there's west. There's kind of this west kind of wilderness style yeah. of science, but there's also energy to be found in a vibrant city. Oh, like absolutely! New, like New I, York I, or Boston, I, uh, there are different different ways of plugging in. Now, the first kind of first energy. ten years here, I lived in this. We lived in the city, and I I always said there's great energy to be had in yeah. in a place that never sleeps, and I drew from that. Now, this yeah. article is cool because if you scroll down to the I don't know second to last photo, it's a photo captioned Harry Noller Center in Cambridge in 1976. And I happen to know this photo because the guy on the left is Rich Condit. Oh, is that right? And he said, he showed this years ago to us. He said they'd spent the whole day from like 10 a.m. in the pub. And you can tell by looking at the picture. Look at their <laughs> It's all smashed. I have to send this to uh, Rich because he, he probably doesn't know it's here. It's pretty cool. Oh, so that's that's Rich on the left? It's Rich on the left, yeah. Okay. He's got oh. a beard there as, as does Nol Noller looks like. Look at the guy. He looks like a rock star. That's right. And um, they they all look a little potted to me. <laughs> I hope yeah. he doesn't know what we're talking about here, but <laughs> should have I should have shared this with you. Uh, my my pick is a is an article in uh, Ars Technica based on a a cool paper out of um, Graham Hatfull's lab at the University of Pittsburgh, and the paper was published in Nature Microbiology. It's called Prophage Mediated Defense Against Viral Attack and Viral Counter Defense. And this is an outcome of this program that uh, uh, Hadfield developed where you get high schools um, all over the country uh, to have their students isolate phages, mycobacterial phages, in their backyard. And here they've, they've done some work on these phages and, and shown simply, they give them cool names. Um, mm -hmm. Tw but Tweety, Tweety, Skinny Pete. But they, they encode <laughs> defense mechanisms that prevent super infection with other phages. And some of these defense mechanisms are like um, restriction systems and uh, mm -hmm. other other types of uh, restriction. But it's, it's a very cool uh, article. But my, my pick is actually the Ars Technica hmm. article that describes it. It's called Biological Warfare Virus Style. And it's written by uh, John Timmer, who I know. And he um, puts it in... in point of view of evolution of viruses so many viruses out there you know they have to fight for uh, hosts and this system of restriction looks to be uh, part of that so if you want the simple version that check out the Ars Technica yeah thanks for that so I saw the um, paper I haven't had a chance to dig into it yet but um, the last time I saw Graham Hatful and sat down with him a few months ago um, I mean my god it just seems like they're on to they're because they have been investing in this program out in the high schools sort of discover all of this diversity around yeah, phages. Yeah. He's now sitting on a gold mine of all of these potential mechanisms emerging from these um, virus host interactions, virus virus interactions, sort of all this sort of complexity going on in bacterial cells. And I just can imagine that we're going to be seeing things that are sort of in that same ballpark of CRISPR that emerged, yeah, you know, sure. 15, 20 years ago. There may be who knows, dozens of other mechanisms Absolutely. that could be sort of harnessed and domesticated and made useful for biotechnology in some ways. They have over a thousand sequenced mycobacteriophages from this program. And yeah, you know, the, the, the kids who isolate them get to name them. That's why, you know, Tweety is named yep. Tweety and so forth. And it's part of the cool thing. This is my phage. Fun. You know, yeah. you can you sequence it, you annotate it, and you name it. And it's a great program. <laughs> That's like there was just t today I saw an announcement of a new um, primate that had been discovered 
um, and they named it after a Star Wars uh, character. So I can't remember the exact name, oh, but I cool. guess that's what you got to do if you discover a new species yeah, or a new right. gene in Drosophila. There you go. Well, yeah. Graham was on TWIV a long time ago, and um, I have to say that the University of Pittsburgh, for some reason, puts ads in airports. I don't know if either of you have seen this, but when I fly out of Newark Airport, you know, on those TV monitors, they put ads, and I see ads, and every now and then I see Graham up there, you know, mm. University of Pittsburgh, you know, virologist. They go through a lot of faculty, but every now and then there's Graham, and I'm looking at and I try and get the picture, but I never can get it uh, <laughs> time properly because I want to send it to Graham and say, why do I have to see you when I travel? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I hope he, so, did, did you, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. did you want to share something, uh, Hopi? I think you might have mentioned something already, right? Yeah, so maybe I, this is probably outside of what you usually talk about in um, pick of the week. But one thing I, I wanted to mention was this um, effort that I think is just um, a really wonderful effort. And it was it's put together and run by Gina Balcom and Megan Duffy, who are both at the University of Michigan. And it's, it's a website called Diversify EEB for Ecology and Evolutionary Biologists. Um, and it's a list of women and underrepresented minorities. And I think the idea, I mean, you'd have to talk to them, but my understanding is the idea that got them excited to do this, um, to put together this list and maintain it um, all through self-nominations um, was to, you know, when people are putting together symposium or talks or thinking about prizes, there was always an excuse of, well, we couldn't think of a, a female or somebody who would help diversify our list of speakers or prize winners. And here they put together this list, so that excuse is no longer valid. And I just thought it was um, such a nice, creative thing to do, and I really think it's starting to have an impact on the field. So for those of you who are interested, um, you can go to Diversify EEB and self-nominate yeah. um, or nominate a, a colleague who diversifies the field. And uh, Or if you're you know, putting together a uh, symposium or thinking about seminar speakers, it's a great place, great resource. I agree completely, Hopi. Yeah. And actually, this is another case of convergent evolution. So if we go back just a couple episodes to Twivo number 12, um, huh? We interviewed a fellow, or had a fellow on the show, Josh Drew. Do you know him from? Uh, uh, he's at Columbia, yep. and he he his pick of the week was Diversify EEB. Ah, so <laughs> great. <laughs> Perfect. So Not we will so original as I thought. That's okay. well, no, that's great. But that's this is a, another case where when you see something independently emerge, it gives you. <laughs> Uh, uh, the idea that, wait a minute, maybe I should pay attention to this. This could be important. And so I think we've hit on something that really, really is an important um, thing. And so we will post that again. Um, I would also... There's similar, sorry, there's similar, yeah. there's a, one called Anne's List that's associated with neuroscience. And there's uh, another wonderful list in the same sort of, or a, a wonderful site called NeuroWatch, where they mm -hmm. sort of call out symposia or um, groups that are not very diverse using the shaming technique to try mm -hmm. to um, rectify this problem. Mm -hmm. Shaming. We'll those, Sh shaming we'll is, the, the shaming is very effective when you have a, <laughs> a meeting with, uh, you know, 50 men and one woman on it. It's just, mm -hmm. you can't imagine how they can do this, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <clears throat> That's right. Great. So, and then we'll also, I mean, you also mentioned earlier in the show that book, Time, Love, and Memory. I think it would be, we should um, highlight that. Yep. As, uh, we'll put that in that, as well. Uh, certainly on my radar now to grab a copy and, and take a look. All right. That'll do it for Twevo 15. You can find it at iTunes, microbe.tv slash Twevo, T-W-I-E-V-O. And of course, most people listen on their cell phones these days using an app that either comes with the phone or you buy the, to listen to podcasts and you can easily subscribe to Tweevil uh, using that app. Now, consider supporting the science shows that we do here at Microbe TV. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of ways you can help us uh, support our shows. We have a Patreon account. We also have an Amazon affiliate link and other ways as well. We appreciate that. It allows us to do some traveling and visiting uh, guests throughout the country. We also love getting your questions and comments. You can send them to Twevo at microbe.tv. Our guest today has been Hopi Hoekstra. She's a Howard Hughes uh, Institute investigator at Harvard University. You can also find her on Twitter, Hopi Hoekstra. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. This has been great. Yeah, yeah thanks, Hopi. Awesome. 
Nels Eldy is at cellvolution.org. You can also find him on Twitter, L Early Bird. Good to see you again, Nels. You too, Vincent. Any plans to come back east in the near future? Yeah, and not the too distant future, actually. I think in the next month or two, I will be in New York for um, a workshop on social evolution of genomes. That I, and I think, Hopi, you and I might collide there. Exactly. I just noticed that. That's great. That will be yeah. fantastic. Well, maybe, Nails, maybe we can get together. Let's do that for sure. Yeah, stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on Twivo is performed by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com. You know, I just realized it's turtles all the way down. That's why they're trampled. <laughs> there, now we're talking. Anything underneath. We thank Blue Apron for their support of Twivo. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious. Hopi, how do you pronounce your last name? Um, the way you can pronounce it is um, Hoekstra. Hoekstra, but it's technically yeah. something else, right? Well, if you want to, you know, pronounce it with the correct Dutch accent, yeah. But. Would it be hook or something like that? Hoekstra. Hoekstra. So the guy who invented the microscope. Yep. Is that the same? The end of his name is similar, right? Yep. Hook. Yep. So how would you how would you produ- Lewin, pronounce Lewin Hook? how would you pronounce his name? Um, Lewin Lewin Hook. I can't, I can't. I don't even. My Dutch is so bad these days. I'm not <laughs> even sure I could do it. So H O E K Hook Hook uh, means the corner. So, um, what like, there's the Hook of Holland. That's the sort of bottom hook. southwest side of Holland, the big port. So, Hook. What does Stra mean? It sort of means from the from the corner. <laughs> so you're from the corner. That's I know. <laughs> but there's like Boomstra and Dijkstra, and you know, yeah, yeah. Nice. All those are northern northern Holland, Friesland. So you you're okay if I say Hoekstra. Is Hoek, fine. Hoekstra. Yeah, I mean, it, I, yeah. I think you should go for the Dutch. That sounds more <laughs> spicy to me. Hoekstra? Hoekstra? <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. yeah. I'll try it. I like pronouncing things properly. I don't know. Oh, well, I can barely pronounce it properly, so I wouldn't, you know, insist you do.